Hey everyone, so given my recent debunking activity, I get lots of requests for topics to cover, and the one I get the most is vaccines. Now, unlike the obscure hoaxes I normally debunk, vaccines are something that the entire population interfaces with and has an opinion about. These opinions vary due to differing levels of education as well as exposure to misinformation, which ranges from insane lies to more subtle propaganda. So in putting this together, I wanted to address as many of the false talking points that are floating around as humanly possible, in the hopes that any vaccine skeptics who may be watching will be able to briefly suspend their convictions and listen to the other side. Now, I know that the COVID vaccine is on the forefront of everyone's mind, and I will get to that towards the end, but I wanted to approach this in a more general way. So I'm going to start out by briefly explaining what vaccines are and how they work. This may be review for most, but we need to do this for context. Then I will address every bit of misinformation I have ever heard about vaccines. And finally, I'll wrap things up with the new COVID vaccines and some common concerns about them. Hopefully everyone will learn something new and perhaps forget some lies as well. So let's get started. What are vaccines? Well, I cover the history of their development in some detail over in my History of Drugs series, so for the full story, head over there. But for those in a hurry, I will summarize as quickly as possible. Throughout all of human history, the most common cause of death has always been infectious pathogens, which means a microorganism that can cause disease. The Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe in the 14th century, was caused by Yersinia pestis, a species of bacterium. Even bigger killers, by pure numbers at least, have been tuberculosis, also caused by a bacterium, smallpox, caused by a virus, and dozens of other horrifically deadly diseases that are now either non-existent or easily treatable. For the longest time, we had no clue what caused these diseases, as we couldn't see these organisms. Our incantations and primitive medical techniques had no effect, and we were totally helpless against them, apart from the faculties of the immune system we all possess. So how does the immune system deal with pathogens? Well, this is immensely complicated, and I have just begun an immunology series which will cover all aspects of the immune system in significant detail. But again, to summarize the basics as briefly as possible, once something like a virus infects host cells, some of its surface proteins are recognized as foreign by immune cells, and in response to these foreign markers, called antigens, the immune system produces other proteins called antibodies. These are able to recognize that specific antigen and bind to it, tagging it for destruction by other immune cells that eat up invaders. Once these antibodies have formed, they stick around as long as the invaders are still active, and then slowly disappear from circulation. But there are also specialized cells called memory cells that can remember how to generate that specific antibody, sometimes for several decades, such that if the invader infects again at a later time, the immune system can mount a much faster response to the antigen and eradicate it before significant infection occurs. This is why most infectious agents render a person immune from successive infections, if the immune system reacts quickly enough to the first attack and the person recovers, which obviously is not always the case. Now, before we had any clue about the immune system, we had already recognized immunity as a concept, since we were able to see that people usually didn't get infected by the same thing twice. That's why crude forms of immunization have been practiced for over a thousand years, like a technique called variolation, which was used to fight smallpox, in which people were deliberately exposed to someone else's smallpox scabs through a cut in the skin or inhaling up the nose. But this was really just infecting oneself with smallpox, and it was a risky procedure with a significant mortality rate. Then, in the 18th century, a man named Edward Jenner innovated this approach. He used a slight variant of the smallpox virus called the cowpox virus, which was not as dangerous, and exposed patients to that instead, finding that it bestowed them with immunity against smallpox as well. He had no idea what viruses even were, let alone that this worked because of the structural similarity of the two viruses, which caused antibodies to be generated that would recognize both viruses, thus priming the immune system for smallpox infection without having to be infected with smallpox. But even without this knowledge, the new vaccination technique worked wonderfully with a substantially lower risk of mortality, and it was soon adopted worldwide, eventually leading to the complete eradication of smallpox by 1980. 
So with this earliest example, we can see the basic mechanism by which all vaccines operate. Over time, the approach was refined, but the core principle was always the same. Expose the immune system to some particle. This could be a weaker analog of a deadly virus. It could be an attenuated version of the virus, meaning that it is modified so that it has difficulty infecting and replicating within cells. It could even be just the isolated surface protein that the virus uses to gain entry to cells. Once any of these things enter the bloodstream, the immune system goes through the slow process of the primary immune response, and then, if that pathogen is ever truly encountered, the body is already prepared to destroy it immediately via antibodies and the secondary immune response, doing so before infection can even occur. Obviously, this was the ultra-condensed explanation, and with some knowledge of biochemistry and microbiology, we could talk for a thousand hours about what we just said, but at its essence, that's what vaccines do. And this is no small feat. The average life expectancy across the world was only around 30, all the way until the turn of the 20th century. The main factor in this figure more than doubling in less than a century is our recent ability to prevent infection with vaccines and eradicate pathogens pathogens with modern drugs. Okay, so with that out of the way, what are some of the talking points that are brought up against vaccines and their use? Well, let's start with the most absurd narrative I've heard, and from a scientific standpoint, that would be outright denial that pathogens like viruses even exist at all. That's right, some people say that infectious microorganisms are not real. This is astounding. We've been able to see bacteria in microscopes since the 17th century, and we've been looking at viruses in electron microscopes since the early 20th century. There are tens of thousands of people all over the world whose job it is to study these things. They're called microbiologists and virologists, and the things they study do exist. A slight modification of this view is that viruses exist, but they don't cause disease. Again, this is complete nonsense. We observe them. We culture them, which means allowing them to infect cells and multiply. We study in great detail the precise mechanisms by which they gain access to a cell and force that cell to express the viral genome. We have sequenced the genomes of all the viruses we study. We know what protein each gene codes for and what each protein does. We deliberately allow things called retroviruses to infect cells to perform medical techniques like gene therapy. We know what viruses are and how they work. Work. The most damaging pusher of this lie as of late has been a psychiatrist turned naturopath named Andrew Kaufman. He is one of many personalities that has gained traction on YouTube by peddling blatant lies of an absurd nature, like that appendicitis is actually constipation. He maintains that the coronavirus which causes COVID does not exist, nor do the viruses that cause AIDS hepatitis, measles, and other viral diseases. He claims that what scientists are observing are actually exosomes, or tiny vesicles ejected from a cell that are of human origin and contain human DNA. There is nothing to even discuss here. That is wrong. COVID is caused by a novel coronavirus. Some say it has never been isolated. That's wrong. It's trivial to isolate and has been done countless times. Its genome has been sequenced, which again is trivial. Some like to say that viruses don't exist because they don't fulfill Koch's postulates. Well, Robert Koch didn't know that viruses exist, and his postulates don't apply universally. They've been obsolete for over a century. Even Koch himself recognized that not everyone who carried bacterial infections like typhoid fever or cholera exhibited symptoms, so there were immediate caveats to his postulates, and they are now known to be essentially irrelevant in comparison with modern sequencing techniques. Without diving into the particulars of microbiology, people who bring up Koch's postulates to discredit the existence of viruses do not know what those postulates are and are just regurgitating a lie they heard on the internet. It can't be made clearer that Kaufman has zero knowledge of microbiology and is just another con man cashing in on the anti-science alt-health craze.
For a multitude of psychological and sociological reasons, a huge portion of the population responds favorably to literally any narrative which states that science and Western medicine are wrong. It doesn't matter who is saying it, or what their qualifications are. It doesn't matter what their motives are, or what they're selling, which, by the way, for Kaufman, is outrageously expensive natural health consultations and an assortment of bogus products plastered all over his website. A certain demographic of people will eat up any narrative of this variety like candy because it satiates their anti-establishment bias. I won't go too far with this because it deserves a whole video unto itself, but Kaufman and all others in his camp are objectively wrong. Viruses exist, and they cause disease. Denying the germ theory of disease is like denying the existence of gravity or claiming the Earth is flat. It deserves nothing but mockery. Moving up the ladder, we leave the realm of outright denial of reality to chemophobia. There are many people who understand that pathogens exist and do cause disease, and that vaccines do work in preventing diseases. But they take issue with what's inside the vaccine. To them, it's a soup of nasty chemicals that Big Pharma has concocted, either intending deliberate harm or merely indifferent to its harmful properties. This sentiment is called vaccine hesitancy, and it has a long history, so I want to spend some time here. Now, although there are many talking points to address, the modern anti-vaccine movement received a huge boost due to a British physician named Andrew Wakefield. In the 1990s, many parents with children who had developed autism-related syndromes felt that a vaccine was responsible. There was, of course, no real basis for this. It was just a gut feeling from scientifically uneducated people looking for something to blame. But the narrative picked up steam, and it attracted a number of personal injury lawyers who began circling like sharks, ready to exploit the fury and make some money. A lawyer named Richard Barr knew he could cash in if he could get someone qualified to provide some evidence for this link, so he found a gastroenterologist who had already published something on this hypothesis. Wakefield, and paid him about half a million pounds to produce a study that would give him the green light to sue. Wakefield got to work, and in 1998, he published a study in The Lancet claiming that the MMR vaccine, which inoculates against measles, mumps, and rubella, is linked to a number of gastric disorders and autism. Immediately after publication, he called a press conference suggesting that instead of inoculating against all three at once, a series of separate vaccines should be adopted, including one for measles, which he had conveniently filed a patent for and neglected to disclose. But much more importantly, the study itself was completely fraudulent. It had only 12 subjects, making it statistically meaningless. And furthermore, all 12 children involved in the study were clients of Richard Barr, some of whom were known to be autistic prior to receiving the MMR vaccine. Wakefield also heavily manipulated all of the data. So essentially, the law firm funded the research with the intended results in mind, paid Wakefield to do it, and then paid off a handful of other researchers in the US and UK to support the findings. Other studies were never able to replicate the results of Wakefield's study, and even proved conclusively that there is no link between the MMR vaccine and autism. So the fraudulent study was later retracted, but it was too late. Barr and Wakefield had already initiated a media frenzy, which was perpetuated by a handful of incompetent celebrities, and the damage had been done, with a resurgence of measles outbreaks that led to a number of deaths. There was eventually some justice, as years later an investigative journalist named Brian Deere wrote up a story in the British Medical Journal outlining what I've just told you in much more detail, exposing the scam from top to bottom. Wakefield sued the journal and Deere himself, but the lawsuits were dismissed, and he was disbarred from the British Society of Medicine. With no more professional life left in Britain, he moved to the U.S. and became the hero of the American anti-vaccine movement, treated as a martyr instead of the detestable villain he truly is. He now lives a lavish lifestyle with his girlfriend, former supermodel Elle McPherson, giving high-priced talks on expensive cruises to gullible rich people. He is also responsible for the pseudo-documentary Vaxxed, in which he doubles down on all the fraudulent science surrounding the MMR vaccine, but this time aimed at suggestible laypeople, amounting to blatant propaganda to fuel his cash cow. Wakefield is a con man, plain and simple. So that's the short and sweet version of the whole vaccines autism link and how the myth got started. Vaccines do not cause autism. Full stop, period. 
But what exactly is in vaccines, and can anything in them cause some other kind of harm? Let's talk about specific ingredients and what people say about them. First, most anti-vaxxers talk about mercury. This is because of a compound called thimerosal, which was sometimes used as a preservative in vaccines, meaning a substance that prevents contamination. Thimerosal has a mercury atom in it, and this is often cited in the context of the autism link. This lie preys on ignorance towards basic principles of chemistry. Elemental mercury is rather toxic, due to its ability to inhibit important enzymes. This does not apply equally to every molecule that simply contains a mercury atom. These are very different things. Molecules that contain one or more atoms of a particular element do not behave like that element in isolated form. Otherwise, one would presume that any carbon-containing compound, like, say, sugar, must be a diamond. Toxicity is complex and impossible to understand without discussing how molecules interact with proteins in the body. Simply looking at which elements are present in a molecule tells you nothing whatsoever about what that molecule will do. Most organic compounds are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Those four elements, plus a couple others, combine in different ways to make up most of what's in your body and most of what we eat. They also make up the most toxic compounds in existence. The single most toxic compound known is the botulinum toxin, which is a naturally occurring protein produced by the bacterial species Clostridium botulinum, with a gram of it being enough to kill 10 million people. And as it is a protein, it is made of the same elements as literally every other protein. Consider an even simpler example. Sodium is a highly combustible metal that ignites spontaneously when exposed to moisture and causes severe irritation upon contact with the skin. Chlorine is a yellow toxic gas that was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. Put them together and what do you get? Sodium chloride, table salt. Identifying the elements present in a compound does not tell you what it will do. Those who do not understand basic chemical principles like this are therefore easy to scare. Propagandists will say of thimerosal, hey, there's mercury in this, and mercury is toxic, so this is toxic. Well, there isn't elemental mercury in there, just like there isn't oxygen gas or diamonds. It's a compound with a mercury atom in it, and in the minuscule amount present in any vaccine, it is harmless. Countless studies have confirmed this. Some will compare it not to elemental mercury, but methylmercury, which can be dangerous in large doses, and is the source of mercury poisoning from seafood. Thimerosal does produce some ethylmercury in solution, but the toxicity of ethylmercury is nowhere near that of methylmercury or elemental mercury. It is cleared from the body much more rapidly, and at the concentrations that had been present in vaccines, it was completely negligible. We must be aware that literally everything is toxic in high enough dosage, so to discuss toxicity without talking about concentration is totally misguided, particularly when humans are exposed to comparable amounts of mercury in breast milk, formula, and common foods we all eat. Since the Wakefield incident, dozens of studies have been performed by a multitude of reputable institutions, comprised of millions of children, in stark contrast to Wakefield's 12, all failing to establish any correlation between autism and thimerosal, or the MMR vaccine in general. Despite all this, thimerosal has since been removed from most vaccines, largely due to a switch towards single-dose vials that do not require preservatives, but also partially to comply with the public frenzy. As has been the case for quite some time by now, all vaccines routinely used on children below the age of six in the U.S. do not contain thimerosal. Not surprisingly, there has been no change in the frequency of autism diagnoses as a result, and there is no difference in prevalence of autism amongst immunized and unimmunized because there is no link. The rise in autism cases since the 1980s is simply due to an increased attentiveness and capacity to diagnose autism in the first place, whereas prior to that time, autistic individuals were just regarded as weird. Autism does not in any way resemble symptoms of mercury poisoning. It is primarily genetic in nature, and vaccines don't cause it. End of story. Now, of course, it doesn't end with thimerosal. What else is in there? Well, according to some, there is aborted fetal tissue in vaccines. This is ridiculous. There has never, ever been any vaccine with aborted fetal tissue as an ingredient. 
Some vaccines require growing a particular virus in a human cell culture, and the cell lines that have produced these cultures came from two legally aborted fetuses in the 1960s, whose stem cells can be utilized indefinitely. This is how the viral particles for the vaccine are grown, which are then purified to remove cellular debris and growth agents. The vaccine doesn't literally contain aborted fetal tissue. The only reason anti-vaccine propagandists say this is because their side door into your trust involves triggering fear and outrage, and lots of people who are susceptible to their lies are also anti-abortion. It's just another button for them to push to get you angry enough to buy what they're selling you. Then comes the variety of other substances that are cited in outrage. A big one is aluminum. Aluminum is the most common metal in nature. It's in the ground, in the air, in the water, in your food, as well as in breast milk and baby formula, so it's in babies too. Aluminum salts are present in certain vaccines as adjuvants, meaning something that improves the resulting immune response. But complaints regarding toxicity are oblivious to one indispensable fact, which is that the dose makes the poison. Again, it is not the case that some substances are toxic and others are not. Literally everything is harmful in high enough dosage. There is an amount of water that if you drink it, you will die. Not drown, mind you. Water intoxication, a disruption of brain function. Without oxygen, we die in minutes, but breathing pure oxygen for a couple hours will kill you. Any substance can kill you. The key is how much it takes to kill you. And even things that are on the more toxic side, discussing them without citing amounts is pointless. Chemicals that are known to be significantly toxic are still everywhere. Metals like lead, cadmium, thallium, there's some of each in your body at all times, even in the bloodstream. Compounds like formaldehyde are present naturally in dozens of fruits and vegetables, in quantities that would surprise most people. Our bodies are constantly coming into contact with these substances, just in amounts that are extremely tolerable and manageable. So when people worry about aluminum in vaccines without asking how much is in there, they are not understanding the concept of toxicity. The amount of aluminum in a vaccine is so negligible that it does not even measurably raise the levels of aluminum that are already present in any child. There is many times more aluminum in an antacid tablet than in a vaccine. It's nowhere near enough to be harmful, period. The general public needs to get over the idea of bad chemicals and good chemicals. Anything can kill you if you ingest too much, and even the most toxic substances in the world have a threshold below which they will do no harm. The dose makes the poison. Moving on, it would be unfair to skip over the handful of incidents in which vaccine technology was mishandled in unfortunate ways. For example, the forced polio immunization campaign of 1955 resulted in some children accidentally being given the live virus, meaning not attenuated enough, so it just gave them polio. Then there was the swine flu vaccine of 1976, from which 1 in 100,000 developed something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. These are bad things that did happen, which have fueled vaccine hesitancy with some justification. But vaccines have come a long way over the decades, with smaller antigenic loads and better studies and techniques being done. So apart from such isolated incidents, the only generalized anti-vaccine talking points that are even remotely reasonable are the ones regarding adverse reactions and vaccine injuries. There is a risk of anaphylactic shock in people with a history of sensitivity, so there can be mild to moderate consequences for around one in every 53,000 people, though they can be screened for such that those with contraindications can know which vaccines to avoid, and vaccine recipients are monitored in case an adverse reaction occurs. Also, in general, the negative ramifications of vaccine injuries are dramatically outweighed by the immeasurable benefit of totally eradicating pathogens that have killed millions or even billions of people. If the enormous number of deaths due to automobile accidents that occur every year doesn't cause us to discontinue driving cars, then the comparatively negligible number of adverse vaccine reactions certainly should not be considered a reason not to vaccinate. And finally, since it's on everyone's mind, let's run down a short list of the most frequent talking points regarding the COVID vaccines. As most have heard, the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines are mRNA vaccines, and they are the first of their kind. As such, many people are worried about what they view as brand new experimental technology. 
This is not the case. Moderna has been working on this technology for over a decade. The RNA in Moderna refers to RNA. The company formed specifically to develop mRNA technology, including vaccines. That's why they beat dozens of other companies to the punch. Scientists have been working on this for a while, so the pertinent research had already been done. Once the novel coronavirus genome was sequenced, the vaccine was developed immediately. Still, people speculate about the vaccine altering our DNA. This is physically impossible. The way things work inside our cells is that DNA acts as a template for enzymes to build mRNA during a process called transcription, which then serves as a template for a ribosome to build a protein during a process called translation. Check out my biochemistry and biology tutorials if you want more details on this process, but that's the quick version. The mRNA in the vaccine acts as a template for our cells to build the viral spike protein that behaves as an antigen, which our immune cells can then interact with to build the antibodies. Then the mRNA gets degraded along with all of the other mRNA molecules our cells produce every day. That's how the vaccine works, and that's why this approach is brilliant. Any risk associated with using an attenuated virus is gone because there is no virus or viral particle being injected at all. It can't be stressed enough that there is no mechanism by which mRNA can produce DNA in the human body, nor implement DNA into the human genome. It is literally impossible. So if you hear someone say that the vaccine will change your DNA, they either have no idea what they're talking about or they're lying or both. It does not change your DNA. Next, there is a lot of concern regarding what some perceive as a rushed process. Again, while it was the fastest rollout of a vaccine in history, this still isn't accurate. When we say that the vaccine was fast-tracked, we are saying that long regulatory periods were eliminated. Basically, all the bureaucratic hurdles and red tape which would normally delay vaccine development were removed, for obvious reasons. The clinical trials themselves were not abbreviated in any way. It is simply that phase two was being planned while phase one was underway, rather than waiting for approval to begin due to the state of emergency. The same going from phase two to phase three. This is where huge chunks of time were saved. Clinical trials were completed. No one is a guinea pig. People getting the vaccine are not being experimented upon. They are just getting a vaccine. These vaccines were tested just as rigorously as any other. That medical professionals have nearly unanimously been getting this vaccine the moment it is made available to them should be everything you need to know regarding its safety, as they are best equipped to assess its safety, and they all get it. There have been many instances of large-scale emergency vaccinations in the past, such as the one in Yugoslavia in the 1970s in response to the last smallpox outbreak that ever occurred. The entire population of 18 million was rapidly vaccinated, and now we don't have smallpox anymore. To those too young to know what smallpox was, it really, really sucked. A lot and its eradication is a candidate for the greatest scientific achievement of all time. Lastly, of course, there are the Orwellian overtones about microchips and Bill Gates and tracking software and new world orders and so on and so forth. It's really not worth getting into the weeds for every single flavor of this paranoia, so I'll just say one thing. Whatever plans you've heard for implantations delivering vaccines in the future, or tags, or microparticles, or mind control, this isn't it. It's just a vaccine. It doesn't reprogram your cells. It's just a piece of mRNA that codes for a viral spike protein. That's all. So if these other technologies arrive in the future, we can talk about it then. And if you're worried about being tracked based on vaccination status and you own an iPhone, it's too late. You're being tracked already. So as important as the discussion regarding the ethics surrounding technology and privacy may be, it has nothing to do with this vaccine. As society begins to get rolling again, having been vaccinated will be a requirement for doing lots of things. You can interpret that as manipulative or restrictive if you like, but it's just common sense. Whether it's through an app or whatever else, being able to prove you've been vaccinated is a way for businesses to safely open back up and get the economy going again, which is something those who have been complaining about lockdown should be rejoicing over.
Even for those who insist that the low mortality rate makes it pointless for young people to vaccinate, there are plenty of young people who have died from COVID, and we still aren't fully aware of all the long-term effects of the infection. Combining all this with the responsibility of minimizing the risk of infecting others, there is not really any strong position against getting this vaccine. And in the meantime, while we're at it, for those who aren't yet vaccinated or refuse to vaccinate, please wear your masks. Anything you've heard about masks being ineffective or somehow dangerous is ridiculous. Medical professionals wear masks for a reason. They reduce pathogen transmission by 70%. Yes, the pores in the mask are larger than the size of a single virion, but the viruses are not all floating around in the air by their lonesome. They are transmitted primarily through aerosol droplets, which are little bits of water that leave your mouth when you talk or even just breathe. The mask blocks them. That's why they work. Wearing them is the absolute least that people can do to uphold minimal civic responsibility. So that just about covers everything I wanted to say and everything I wish that people knew about vaccines. Unfortunately, most of us do not have a background in biochemistry, microbiology, immunology, or any other field relevant to the concept of vaccine development and administration. What this means is that we base our opinions on what we read. However, with no relevant background with which to assess the validity of what we read, most of us go not by facts, but by other things. We consider the conviction with which claims are expressed. We look at narratives that are presented and decide whether we like them or not, and how well they fit with some pre-existing bias or worldview. For many, this bias is just a vague distrust of anything regarded as an authority, be it a government, a corporation, or even science in general. It's not that these entities never do anything wrong, but people who blindly adhere to this bias are very easy to trick, as they tend to trust anyone who sells an anti-establishment narrative, regardless of its content or their qualifications and motives. They like how it sounds, so it must be true. Remember that the media we consume and the influencers we encounter do not have any responsibility to the truth. Just as detractors of Big Pharma complain that they are only in it for the money, so is a large portion of the media you come across. Some are in it for the clicks, as clicks mean bucks, and fear-mongering controversy brings clicks. Beyond the fact that people without any scientific or medical background are completely unequipped to deliver a reliable take on this and related issues, many people are being deliberately deceitful for financial gain, like Kaufman, like Wakefield. When they tell you to follow the money to Big Pharma, you need to follow the money to them too. This doesn't stop with clicks either. Anti-vaccine sentiment is just one facet of the anti-science movement, which is an enormous consumer trend that the alt-health industry fosters and exploits to sell all-natural supplements, alternative treatments, and all kinds of other goods and services. It's a multi-billion dollar industry based on perpetuating chemophobia and baseless distrust of scientific principles that have given us the modern world many of us take for granted, prolonged life expectancy and all. Again, this is a much larger topic that I intend to tackle from a few different angles in videos to come. So if you found this one to be informative, please like and subscribe and be on the lookout for future debunks regarding quantum mysticism, the organic craze, and other such fascinating social defects that muddy public perception of science. In addition, I've just written a book about all of these topics and more. It's called Is This Wi-Fi Organic? A Guide to Spotting Misleading Science Online. If you're tired of sifting through mountains of contradictory information, I wrote this book to serve as a guide in navigating the digital cacophony that is the internet so that you don't get fooled by hoaxes and propaganda. If you're interested, check out the link below. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.